a very good number. Welcome everyone to the fifth session of our um, lecture series. Today we have two speakers and we also have Professor Laura Gavioli with us who will introduce the two speakers and chair the session. Thank you very much, Laura. Floor is yours. Thank you, Marina. Uh, just very quick presentation. Uh, Professor Geoffrey Williams uh, um, has uh, worked in corpus linguistics for a while. Uh, he has given important contributions to, to lexicography and uh, the perspective that uh, corpus linguistics has, uh, that came with corpus linguistics to lexicography. He's an expert in uh, TI, that is the um, text encoding initiative and uh, has worked on its uh, applications. I think he's still working at a project of uh, uh, about making a digital version of uh, Le Dictionnaire Universel. And uh, uh, he's uh, uh, going to give a, a speech entitled Rubbish In, Rubbish Out, Building Corpora That Represent Something in Language. Professor Bert Meyer teaches intercultural communication. He's an expert in dialogue interpreting. In fact, he's uh, proposed uh, challenging views on dialogue interpreting. And uh, uh, he has uh, uh, edited his recorded material and made a uh, corpus of dialogue interpreting, which I think was the first corpus of dialogue interpreting um, uh, existing. <laughs> uh, he worked with uh, Exmeralda too. And uh, uh, he, uh, I think he's still working with bilingual corpora and his uh, um, talk uh, is uh, um, titled Annotation as Theory, Metadata, Annotations and L Other Layers of Information for Multilingual Spoken Language Corpora. I think you know that you have 20, 25 minutes time uh, to, to speak one after the other because we would like to have a um, full half an hour for uh, discussion, uh, but we normally allow quick questions after uh, the, the first speech in particular. Okay. Okay, so you just uh, manage your presentation uh, as you like, <laughs> or more or less <laughs> as you like, within these constraints. <laughs> okay, so who's going to start then? Um, What's the plan? Uh, I had I had uh, Professor Williams on my list, oh, yeah. but uh, okay. I think it's that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, from the general to the specific, um, and I where did I find that thing on my phone that tells me how long I've been talking chronometer? Right. I'll do that so I don't speak too long. Um, do I have the hand to put my PowerPoint on? Uh, looks like it. Uh, now, where is that PowerPoint? I had it just now. I thought I'd switched all this lot off. Here we go. Right. Okay. Um, is it okay? Yep. Okay. Well, I see one head moving. So, uh, if answers is okay, it should be okay. So, I'll get started. Um, okay, rubbish in, rubbish out. Um, it comes from a meeting a very long time ago, sometime around um, 1998 or something, when uh, I was working in Nantes and uh, we had a conference on um, intelligent, artificial intelligence and terminology. And the invited speaker at that year was Jennifer Pearson, who'd done her PhD with John Sinclair and had worked on uh, translation and terminology uh, with corpora. And this was a new week because at that time IA people only really worked on Chomsky and theories and didn't really look at normal humans at all. And in a conversation with her just after, we spoke about the fact that they just weren't looking at language and she came up with this expression, rubbish in, rubbish out. So I thought this was a, a way to get my talk started because it's pretty much that. So, um, well, I'm here to provoke. So basically, I'm just going to try and get people to think. That's all I'm really trying to do. So um, why build a corpus? Why bother? Um, you can get one on the web. There's loads of constant advertisements on corpora lists saying, please send me a corpus on. Um, people in NLP, natural language processing, do it all the time. 
but that's really because they're interested in tools and not in language as such. We're interested in language, so we need to build it and better build our own. Uh, you could just download the entire web if your machine's big enough. Um, and that's pretty much what some computer systems actually do. And the result is absolutely rubbish in and total rubbish out. Um, but who cares? So why build a corpus? It's essential to know why you're doing it. Is it for your thesis? If it's for your thesis, are you going to use it afterwards? Or are you just going to put it in a drawer and forget it, which is a shame? Um, are you working in a research project? Is that project going to go online? Is that data going to be made available? We are now in the world of open science, so we should be making things fair and available. Are we doing it? Is it professional? If it's a professional application working for a company, is it going to be made available? Are you just doing it for fun? We are doing it out of sheer masochism. And the answer in all cases, obviously, yes, for the latter, because um, it's a it's a lot of work. Basically, I'm going to talk about communicative corpora. That's corpora of authentic language used between people in communication set net um, settings. I'm not talking about literary corpora. I'm not talking about learner or teaching corpora. Both are perfectly valid. It's simply not what I'm going to talk about because I'm more interested in um, language in action. Um, just a quick message, don't reinvent the wheel. I'm going to refer to a lot of old texts and grey literature. It's worth looking at and just don't start from a new. So first thing, very, very quickly, um, there's method in my madness. There really is. I teach conceptualization and that's about awareness raising and that's what I'm going to try and do. So a lot of these things is cultural variations, cultural assumptions, and I'm going to just try and make those available using some fairly odd examples. So let's go back to the 1960s where we had the Beatles, strange clothing, nudist camps. Um, we didn't have low cost flights. We didn't have roll on, roll off cross channel ferries, which mean you couldn't take your car to the continent easily. We didn't have desk or portable computers. We didn't have scanners. We didn't have internet. We didn't have email. We had peace. Life in the, 19, in the 2020s, we do have Beatles music still. We have crap clothing made in just about everywhere. We have nature's holidays. We have crap airlines. We have easy travel. We have data mining, which uses crap corpora. And we have COVID-19 just to keep us amused or locked down too much of our time. In between, we had corpus linguistics, decent corpora and thought about language. So what went wrong? Okay, so um, what went wrong? Um, well, basically we are using too much internet corpora and when you get internet corpora, you get um, noise. And that's why my first example is obviously one which is designed to provoke um, on the difference between naturist and nudist if you look on the internet. Naturism is seen as something good. It's a philosophy. Uh, so you get homestays, you get holidays, and it's wonderful, it's young people. As soon as you start looking at nudism, you've got nakedness, so you've got the porno people coming in. There's masses of them on the web, and your corpus, this is from, this is Sketch Engine, it is absolutely full of rubbish. Um, I keep getting interrupted because it wants me to do things and I can't, I, my screen's blocked. Ah, no, it's okay. um, obviously in France we've had a recent pretty horrible thing happening to a school teacher so I've looked up homicide and assassination and unfortunately you will find on assassination some fairly weird things popping up. Again you've still got the porno because they're there to try and get in and the problem is if you download things you're going to get that rubbish and it does mean that you'll end up with not having good outcomes because you've got too much noise. This we're going to come back to. So this is setting the scene to, uh, I keep having to let people in, so I'm letting people in, right. Uh, now I hope I can, it's blocking every now and again. Um, I have a lot of people asking to come in and it blocks my screen every time I say yes. Uh, so I'm blocked. I don't know if you can unblock me. Uh, what do you mean with a lot of people? Um, I keep getting things on my screen saying somebody's in the waiting room, let them in. And every time that appears, my screen blocks. There's, there's no one in the waiting room. Okay, right. Um, That's strange. Uh, wait a minute. 
I'll get rid of it. Uh, I've still got somebody else appearing. There's Alberta Boshi waiting to come in. Um, and uh, so I'll scrap it, but um, it's, uh, and I'll see if I can move my screen again. Are you are you using your presentation in full screen mode or not? Yes. Weird. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's um, it's blocked, and I have uh, okay. Now it's started again, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So sorry. Um, wonderful thing, Zoom, when it works. It is good though. Right, corpus linguistics then is about comparing. So we do need well-built specialized corpora if you've got your own corpus and you need good general corpora. And I think that's what we don't have anymore because we've simply gone to downloading the web. Um, the big question is, do we need part of speech markup and lemmatization? I would say yes, because they're free and you can switch them on and off when you want to. John Sinclair didn't like either, but um, they're there, they're free, they're cheap, and they can create noise, but you remove the noise when you want to. TI structuring, I'm not going to go into TI structuring, but yes, you do need it, because you need to be able to break your corpus down into parts and look at what's happening. So, back to the history then. Um, I'm probably out of time by now. Angus McIntosh, uh, well, that's going back to the 40s. Basically, you've got somebody who worked in the secret base in Bletchley Park, where they were building their first computer to look at codes. Um, he was in Edinburgh University, and this is where John Sinclair was working. So this is where you get a background of people who realise computers are important. In the 60s, we had three corpus being developed. The Brown Corpus, which you know, the Frantex Corpus, which you may not know. It's a corpus in France, which is not really a corpus. It's a collection of texts to build a dictionary. Uh, and the Osti Corpus, which John Sinclair was burn building in Birmingham. Back to ro roll on, roll off and cheap flights, they didn't meet. You could not meet people in those times, so people were running in parallel. Yes, they would cross information when they could, but you did not have the conferences we do now. So this means a very different outlook at the beginning of the uh, corpus era. We move on to the 80s and we get co-build, we get the British National Corpus and a plethora of others. So we're beginning to get lots of corpuses available. And it's um, blocking my screen again. Uh, right. Go back to some old texts. I could go back much further, but John Sinclair um, was one of the authors of a, in a book on developing linguistic criteria, which is, I just checked it or checked it yesterday and it's marked being archived, but it is still available free online at that address. So his classic definition, a collection of pieces of languages in electronic format selected according to exterior criteria to represent as far as possible, a language or language variety as a source of data for linguistic research. In other words, you can't download the web, you're building criteria, you have building criteria. These criteria include, now I'm underlining things, we're looking at the community function of the text and the community in which they're used. We're looking for something which is representative, whatever representative means, but you cannot have representativity if you've not looked at the community and the community give function. Um, you've got external and not internal criteria. I can come back on that because I don't agree. Because he also says specialized corpus won't respect this and um, internal criteria I think are necessary at some point. So I'll go through fairly quickly then. Mass data can move out some variations which small corpus cannot. So if you have a small corpus, you're gonna to have to make your criteria clear. Um, but if you've got mass data, if you look at details, you're gonna get rubbish. So, Coming back to what I said in the beginning, if we're building a corpus, why, what do we want to study, what are we analysing, who are we analysing, whose speech are we analysing, and who are we actually addressing, who are we doing it for? So, if you're building your corpus, you should be looking at the communicative function, what people are doing and why. We've got to be looking at the community, and we're going to be divided up into different sorts of communities, and we need representativity. So what's a community? Well, I'm very fond of Wittgenstein's theory of family resemblances because communities are never closed. So you're going to have to decide where you're looking at any one point, which is why I'm also very fond of Eleanor Roche's work uh, in sociology. And so it's a core and periphery. So you're going to decide what's core to your area and people who are on the outside. And this is addition you're going to be constantly doing. And this is why you might need some internal criteria to work out where that periphery is. John Swales did 
very important work on discourse communities. We're going back to 2000, the year 2000 and around then. And my own work is on scientific discourse communities. We're just trying to refine what we're talking about. But I'm also going to mention some social communities, national and supranational communities. Um, give me a nod if I'm too long, because I know I lost a little bit of time, but I'm going to go through quickly some ideas. Oh, and it's going to drive me up the wall by asking people to come in. So it's doing it again. Right. Discourse community. Um, Frank Knowles and Peter Rowe, going back to the 90s, group of individuals who have a shared purpose, publicly subscribe to that shared purpose, and they have mechanisms and procedures for their shared objectives. So this is our community. You can call it discourse, you can call it any sort of community you like. John, Sinclair, uh, John Swale, sorry, um, brought in the fact that these people need a common aim, they need a means of interaction, they need participative mechanisms, they use certain genres, they acquire specific lexis so they're when they're talking amongst themselves, they know what they're talking about, and a community is closed. But as I've said, that closure is never a reality. It's always something that is more or less wide. So does this work? How many of these criteria can we apply at any time? So to do that, a few examples. It's going to definitely try to grab me up the wall because um, I keep letting people in or it asks me if I am. And then it goes, and then it blocks, which is what it's doing all the time. Try again. Okay, right. Um, so scientific discourse community. Well, you can have it based on a discipline. You can do biology, but that's a little bit big. So you might want to go something smaller. And then you have to decide whether disciplines exist because as you get smaller, you'll find that they go into specialities and they go into things that are so fine, they're mixing with other disciplines. But it's one way of doing it. You can do what I did, which was to look at a thematically based community where they have a common object. And there you put a, a, a terminological clash with people with different points of view. So you've got to look at where they're coming from. You've got their various genres. So you're going to have to decide whether you're having articles, research articles from journals, uh, whether you've got newsletters, their outreach or blogs. But all of this must be coded so you know what you're looking at and who is central. <coughs> now, we have to take into account open and citizen science because people are talking to citizens. So you're going to have a lot of outreach and you must realize that that is talking to a community, but a different community. So these are all things which you have to bear in mind when you're trying to build your corpus. <coughs> so back in the 90s, I was building one on parasitic plants. Fascinating subject, which I could bore you with for a long time. Thematically based. So I have people from different disciplines, whether it is in biology, whether it's in physics, whether it's in chemistry, looking at and integrating into a community, which I integrated. This means there's a problem of observer paradox because I was involved, <coughs> but it's also essential because um, I was able then to talk to people and find out what texts were valid and what were not in their opinion. It also meant I had very clear needs because I was teaching and I had clear needs because they needed terminology. <coughs> because when you have different communities working together, you have to come together around certain points, which you do not. Take the word gene, where um, I found 16 different definitions being thrown about. Simple, basic, because if you're doing molecular biology, it's central, but the definitions were wildly different. They shared a genre, and I used criteria, criteria to try and break down into groups to work out where people were coming from. So this became essential to look inside the corpus. <coughs> Another one, I'm gonna go very quickly because I've got too many things, where I was asked to put together a corpus on scientific text. Um, this came to a very interesting problem because my colleagues in, uh, in France thought that they were looking at themselves. They were looking at literary texts because scientific in France means any academic paper. So this is my question, what's academic discourse? Because I can't gung-ho into biomedical because that's where I work. And they didn't realize. So you can easily have confusion when you're building a corpus because people's starting points are different. So we build a mega corpus, but it's a mega corpus of open access text. It means I can make it available, but I'm only looking at a part of a community. So where are my criteria? How am I going to break it down? How am I going to post edit and find out what different topics are being used and what level of genre are being used. Their criteria, you have a mass corpus, 30 million words, but you've got to look at what's inside it. 
oh, this is my new discount thing. This was just to make people smile a little bit. Um, but I actually have a colleague in history who is a specialist in the subject, and uh, he's coming at it from the health and sports point of view, which makes it very interesting. So if you did want to look at that, um, you'd have to look at me membership perspective. Who says they belong to this particular group? You've got to look at national perspectives, because in France, it's very much about philosophy. It's about healthy eating, healthy food. Whereas if I look in a UK magazine and I've looked, they only really want to come on holiday in France and get themselves sunburnt. The UK, where they've got plenty of, uh, the US, they've got plenty of sun, so they can get themselves sunburnt anywhere. They can go to Florida. Um, then you've got all the genre they might be using. Academic publications, because my colleague is a historian. Wellness publications for your health, what you're eating, etc. Magazines, newsletters. I think you might have a basic problem with your community is whether people still join groups or whether people simply go to a beach because they want to. So this is the sort of thing, if you're looking at a social community, you might have problems building up your criteria, but you've got to think about it. My political side, well, it's the same thing. There's no clear community. You've got shared viewpoints, but where do they come from? The press, from police. What level of, pol of policing are they? Are you looking at the detective? Are you looking at national level? Are you looking at the law, legal communities, academic with a spelling mistake or professional with another spelling mistake? Lawyers or judges, the law itself, which is a corpus, or politicians who are doing political posturing because they've got to be on the news about every subject. So looking at community is trying to develop um, the actual criteria you need to work on. Um, I was I had the luck to be involved in a wonderful EU funded project where we did develop big corpora, big comparative corpora um, over several years for four different languages. Here we use the national press, but we had to decide what was going to be used in common. Did we have the left wing press and the right wing press? Um, a very silly thing had to be decided in the UK because Scotland is a nation. Therefore, if you're talking about the Scotsman, it's not a regional newspaper, it's a national newspaper. So we went for the big London ones because it was easier. Financial press, it's a certain point of view. Not all countries have financial press. Regional press from different areas, their border or inside the country because the viewpoint's gonna be different. We used one on the border with Germany, which buried a very different view to the regional press on the border with Spain, national news networks. What this means is you've got closed data because I cannot make it available because it's simply illegal. It's something I'll come back to rapidly at the end. But we did have comparability to try and compare viewpoints on citizenship, which is what the EU wanted us to do. It was part of a much bigger project. The constraints then. Constraints are accessing the data because you cannot download the web. Um, you can get some stuff out online, but you're going to have to use a lot of optical character recognition. It is very good, but you're going to have to do the work. If you're inside a community, you've got to be aware of your observer paradox. You should now be aware of open science and FAIR, which is behind all research funding now, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. In other words, people have to be able to find your corpus. You have to make it available. It's got to be made in a manner, which is why I preach for the TEI, where you can compare with other corpora and you should be able to reuse it. Is it really applicable in the SSH? Not always, but it should be. Because the question you're going to have to is, do you have rights? My parasitic corpus, I had some of the rights, but journals wouldn't give me access very often, official access. Scientex used open access, so that's okay. Intune, utterly illegal. We simply downloaded the press using various means to get the entire newspaper, which is not allowed. So everybody said, this is wonderful. You can't make it available. And this is an ongoing problem, which the EU probably doesn't understand. Um, okay, the community, I've not built that corpus, maybe I will when I retire. What I'm building now is a historical corpus and it has the advantage that everybody's dead, um, so I can build up the corpus as I want to, but it's much more complicated. So all I'm trying to say is look at your criteria. Don't take anything for granted. Corpus building is highly challenging. It is fun, but it's challenging. If you've got your criteria and you get good data in, you'll get good data out. So in other words, the best way to be a good corpus linguist is to be neurotic, document your choices so you know exactly what you put in and why you put there. And I do hope to see most of you in the flesh, if you like, in 2021 in Modena, because it's frustrating not seeing who I'm talking to, but it is good fun. And if this is shared later, um, well, thanks for listening to me. And I put the articles I've referred to, old sources, but corpus linguistics is a history and 
we too often forget to look back at some of the founding texts, such as the work by Frank Knowles and John Swales, and of course, John Sinclair, because he's the Pope, as far as we're concerned. Thank you. I think I've kept within my time, despite that thing going blonk at me. And so I'm going to stop my screen now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for your talk. Um, <laughs> for your suggestions <laughs> and, uh, and and we hope to see you in the flesh too. Um, any questions? Quick questions? Uh, we can, we will have a, a time to ask questions afterwards, but there are, if there are any quick ones, uh, we can accept that. I spoke too quickly, so they're flabbergasted. Okay, asking. it's just, I have a chart full of thank yous. Okay. All right, I see no question in the chat. So, can you just pass on to uh, Bernd uh, part and then we, uh, 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 we, we listen to all the questions and, and go on with the debate. Okay? Okay, Bern, this, the floor is yours. 20, 25 minutes. Off, but now it's okay. You, you can hear me? Yeah? Yep. Okay, that's great. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Geoffrey, for your uh, inspiring talk. I think my paper uh, fits very well to your last slide, actually, the, the document your choices. <laughs> uh, thing. I think that's really um, an important point. And I will go and present you some, some thoughts about uh, yeah, the, the details um, of yeah, how to document your choices uh, with regard to a very specific um, type of data, and that is the spoken language um, uh, and uh, interpreter-mediated communication. So we are dealing with multilingual data and I'm going to talk about uh, a specific practice in this context, and that is um, annotation, actually. Okay, before I start, I would like to um, give you some background information about where I come from. So my interest is in talk and interaction, language use and in institutions, spoken language, and, and of course, pragmatic functions of language. So I'm not talking about a structural aspects of language, which also can be investigated by using corpora, but rather about um, yeah, specific situations, specific types of, of discourse uh, that you find in, in institutions when interpreters are needed because people have a migrant background and people don't speak the, the, the local language and so they need help of some third person and the qualitative framework that I'm referring to is discourse analysis. We are usually working with small data samples, case studies, or even single transcripts. And so, um, yeah, in the past, it was not really uh, uh, a, a common, common practice to analyze larger data sets. So it was not really something that people did. It was also difficult. Um, but uh, it was also not um, the interest of many researchers to um, compare, for example, different situations or compare speakers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, <clears throat> now, nevertheless, from the early 90s onwards, digital tools were available to create transcriptions, and um, immediately uh, some 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 issues uh, occurred, like uh, questions like the interoperability, the exchange of data, the accessibility, um, especially in the context of different operating systems and sustainable storage, for example. Um, this is something that from the beginning um, uh, yeah, was part of, of that kind of work of transcribing spoken language and multilingual conversations. Um, but uh, it, yeah, it took time until people started to address these issues in a, in a more systematic way. But the questions are always the same, like, like Geoffrey al al already mentioned, it's like, how can others use my data? How can I transfer data from one context to another or from one research project to another? Um, 
yeah, and that was um, uh, partly completely um, impossible in the 90s. Now, <clears throat> this is especially problematic if you if you work with data from from interpreter mediated communication. Um, because it is uh, uh, usually uh, data where people use different languages. Um, and as long as we are working with um, European languages, we can say, okay, it's, it's not that difficult, but if you go for Arabic or Chinese or other languages, or even languages that don't have a script, um, that are simply only spoken languages, regional dialects, for example, or yeah, then it becomes really um, a difficult, uh, 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 a difficult thing. Um, so you are dealing with things like auto orthography, punctuation, different levels of standardization. Um, usually, the standard refers to written language, not to spoken language. And then you need multilingual transcribers, people who are able to understand that particular language, um, if you are not familiar with that language yourself. Um, another issue that, that comes up is the translation of original utterances. So you have a kind of conversation, a uh, piece of talk, you want to transcribe it for any reason, and then um, you need to understand and make it accessible to others, for example, in a presentation, in a conference, others who do not speak that particular language. And that is, of course, um, yeah, th th these are some of the challenges that are uh, associated with multilingual spoken language data. Now, it's a, it's a, yeah, an old thought <laughs> that transcription is a theory and that it's not only a, a technical um, procedure to transfer to tr or to transform spoken language from recordings into a written medium. But that it's, uh, yeah, something, something is going on with the data in the moment you, you write it down. So the speech event is not equal to the transcript. And every step of this constitution of data is based on, on choices. And these choices are very often not, um, not conscious choices, but rather something that people simply do because they think that it's, yeah, that it's nice to have it like this or nice to have it like that. And very often people don't document their choices um, because uh, they think it's, it's somehow um, evident for everybody, which is usually not the case actually. So the choices are based on presuppositions and, and these presuppositions need to be reflected and made explicit, um, which is also a kind of um, quality criteria for research itself. So it helps the researcher if, um, you think about why I would give you later an, an example because this is of course a bit abstract. <clears throat> now different choices need to be documented, meta information, speaker information, transcription conventions and annotations. These are I think the, the four um, main sources of information that need to be documented if you want to fully understand um, a transcript of uh, conversation that has been recorded. So, um, yeah, this is um, a quote from John Dubois from 1991. Uh, the process of discourse transcription is never mechanical, but crucially relies on interpretation within a theoretical frame of reference to arrive at functionally significant categories rather than raw acoustic facts. So it's not about phonetics. It's not about the physical shape of the sound, but rather it's about um, an interpretation that takes place immediately if you start transcribing spoken language uh, into um, a, a, a written medium. The question then is what are the consequences for sustainable and accessible storage of transcriptions of spoken language? And I think that, that annotations are uh, part of um, that consequences that you need to take. Um, <clears throat> now, one thing that, that needs to be doc documented is the meta information. That's something that we do um, by uh, storing or by, by documenting uh, 
uh, information about the event and the properties of the data, the storage information. So where is it? Where does it come from? What is the, the original recording, the, the audio file? What is the, 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 the um, uh, name of that file and things like that. But also, for example, who are the transcribers? So in this um, case, you can see um, that uh, some people uh, uh, are mentioned uh, with their clear name, uh, with their forename, Anna and Carla. Uh, Anna and Carla transcribed uh, that piece of data. And that is sometimes interesting later on when, when, when some doubt comes up, when it's not quite clear why things have been uh, transcribed this way or that way. So um, the meta information facilitates management of data and analysis as well. So it might be interesting for, for both tasks. Then we have speaker information, information about the participants, their languages, their professions, their age, etc. And <clears throat> you can define um, yeah, these, these properties or attributes to um, make your own list of, of uh, relevant information. Um, but uh, some things seem to be trivial, but they are not that trivial. For example, the languages that people use and the languages that are their first language, their second language. Um, so concepts like first language and second language, for example, are quite um, difficult in a migrant context, for example. So if people grow up with two languages at the same time, then usually you have a kind of differentiation for, for functional reasons. Um, so, so one language is used in the family and the other language is used outside the family, um, but that is not, that doesn't fit to this traditional view of first and second language of successive bilingualism. Um, <clears throat> so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, already a kind of theoretical point in here if you claim that someone has, for example, Portuguese as his or her first language if that person is, uh, has grown up in a, a migrant setting in a German speaking country, for example. Okay, <clears throat> so what we have seen is that, that even the, the, the meta information, the speaker information is already somehow biased by theories and assumptions about language. And this um, is even more uh, the case if it comes to annotations. Annotations are usually used to facilitate analysis. Um, a, a very well-known and a very um, yeah, widespread use annotation is a part of speech tagging, for example. So you, you tag words and you say, this is a noun, this is a verb, this is an adjective, etc. cetera. Um, but in, in this piece of data that I'm showing you here is we, we didn't do that, we didn't annotate for part of speech, but rather for um, languages and uh, translation status, because it's about um, uh, an interpreter mediated an event. So people are talking to each other using an interpreter. The interpreter in this case is a nurse with uh, Portuguese as a family language, and the patient is a Spanish speaking patient. Um, and they are talking about the, the, the electrocardiogram. So some kind of medical procedure. Um, and here the, the, the patient says, Como llama? How, how is it called? And the interpreter replies to him, ah, the, the ECG, the electrocardiogram. Um, and that is uh, an utterance that is uh, categorized by us as a mixed utterance because she's using a German acronym together with a Portuguese preposition, and we um, categorized it also as a non-rendition. Okay, so this is this is the the the, 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 the part that I'm talking about, um, and on the left hand you see the layers that we uh, attached to this little stretch of talk. So we have a verbal tier. That's what the person actually says. And then we have a German translation, and then we have a translation into English, and we have a categorization of the whole utterance as a mixed utterance. And then we have the translation status, which says this is not a translation, this is a non-rendition. It is not meant to, to, to be rendered to um, 
another person that is participating in the event, but rather a reply to a question that the patient asked to the interpreter. Now, <clears throat> the first layer is the translation tier for German and English. The second layer is the language tier classifying the languages used, which at first glance seems to be easy, but um, very often it is not quite, um, quite clear whether this is, for example, uh, really a pure Portuguese or Spanish utterance if people use some kind of, of lexical material, for example, that comes from German or that is somehow um, pronounced in a, in a strange way or something like that. And then we have a, a third layer that is the translation status tier. Mm, and that classifies whether the utterance is a translation or not. Now, the translation tier uh, um, is based on theories about translation, actually. So translation theory usually emphasizes the purpose, who is the intended readership, what kind of analysis can be carried out on the basis of such translation, what are the limitations of analysis based on second-hand data. So if you don't speak Portuguese, to which extent are you able to analyze the data if you only understand uh, the translation, the back translation into English or German? And of course, what are the alternative or additional options like post tagging or, for example, verbatim translations? Do you need that or do you think, no, it's not necessary because we don't want to go into the details, we are only interested in uh, yeah, the content in a very um, global way. And we're not looking at, at specific grammatical structures, for example, and you may say, okay, no, post-checking is not, not important for this kind of data, but it's a decision, okay? So the language here, um, yeah, is, is uh, identifying the language, whether it is in German or whether it is in another language. Um, and then, of course, uh, the mixed utterances, which are of particular interest for us. But, um, of course, you have types of, you can, for example, mix languages by using a single word or an acronym, as in the case that I've shown you. Uh, or you can pronounce things in, in a different way, or you can switch between um, different languages one part of your utterance or of your contribution is in Portuguese, the other part is in German. Um, so all kinds of, of mixings take place in migrant se settings. The languages are not clearly separated from each other. And of course, code switching research has a lot of different terminologies and research traditions. Um, and so, yeah, it's a kind of choice to um, go into the details of that or not. The point here is um, the more differentiated the annotation system is, the more individual decisions transcribers have to make. So it is a kind of um, yeah, a problem of, of reliability, of inter reliability. If you um, pose too much emphasis and if you want too much differentiation, less theoretical background means more reliability. But then of course, the data are not very rich. The annotations are not very um, differentiated. Okay, the third tier is the translation status, which is also interesting for, for our specific research purposes. Um, is it a translation of previous talk or if it's an utterance from, from a primary interlocutor, will it be translated later on in the conversation or not? So that's the, the kind of distinction that we made, rendition and non-rendition, source and non-source. We did not evaluate the renditions. We did not um, differentiate between different types of renditions, although uh, theories um, proposed differentiated uh, 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 taxonomies of um, how translations of, of spoken language could be uh, yeah, evaluated or, or differentiated from each other. Um, <clears throat> again, 
our approach was minimal theory um, based on lemantics. If content appears in an utterance of the interpreter, it is rated as a rendition, independently of how much of the content and how much other stuff has been brought in by the interpreter. All this uh, uh, has to be ignored by the transcribers or by the people who rated the utterances. So to conclude, um, <clears throat> uh, digital spoken language corpora enhance access accessibility and sustainability of data. That is, of course, crystal clear. Um, but the data constitution is biased by theoretical and practical choices. And um, these choices need to be documented by different types of information, like the meta information, the speaker information, the information about how you have, what kind of uh, transcription conventions do you apply, and also about the way how annotations have been made. And yeah, I would say a rule of thumb is that if you keep the theory small, um, you have less problems with the reliability of your uh, annotations and the uh, uh, coherence um, between different uh, uh, decisions made by, by different transcribers, but uh, you should never ignore the theoretical bias, which is always there, even if you um, claim that, uh, uh, that, that you keep theory small. Okay, here's some, some references and some information about the data that you can access if you, uh, if you are interested in that. Um, but I think that this, yeah, this conclusion somehow fits to what, what Geoffrey says. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bernd. Um, I think we can, uh, um, you can start asking questions now. Um, you can uh, uh, write in the chat, uh, which will be visible to everyone, or you can uh, open your microphones briefly, uh, one at a time, and uh, <laughs> ask questions. Okay, so any question uh, is welcome. Just make a comment to to Bernd. Of course, yes, absolutely. Um, one thing, I, well, one of the things we're having for me, I store criteria and information in the TEI header. One of the things I think we lack in corpus building is grey literature, because we write so much, we do so much about how we're building our corpus, but if you try and publish it, you're told that's boring. It's already been said. Where in fact, that accumulative knowledge of what we have done and why, um, you might do it when you're writing a thesis and that will get used. But for the rest of us, it's a tremendous loss of data which would help people. And I know in my own world of TEI work, it's something where we were immediately said, oh, that's not interesting. Whereas on my work on dictionaries, well, actually nobody else has done it. So it would be useful to talk to other people um, so this grey literature, I think, is something we lack and we should have. I can only agree to that. <laughs> Actually, I, I made the experience that some journals rejected a, a small piece of paper about uh, corpus creation, actually, by saying, yeah, but that's not research. <laughs> so yeah. that's, 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 that's only methodology, you know, which is true. I mean, it, it isn't methodology, but it's I think very often people, um, especially in discourse analysis, methodology is not um, extensively reflected. So people apply it to certain sets of data and, uh, and that's it. So, but, but whether it's a good methodology, whether you can enhance it, whether you can do other things as well, um, that's something that, that yeah, is not considered to be um, research. Yeah, we take a lot for granted and we need somewhere to show what we're saying.
Okay. Um, there's a question by Josef uh, Schmidt uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, he's asking if Clarin solves the problem of documentation. I mean, when, when you're ready to, to get to that. Um, where would you put it on Clarin? I'm not really sure it does. One of the, the other problems I think is that when you build a corpus, okay, I, I, I said that some corpus you cannot make available, but you should be able to make available how you do it. And so many things just disappear, um, you know, a few years, months after a project's finished, the, the website goes dead. So uh, yeah, it would be lovely if Clarin could do it, but I'm not really sure how. If anybody has the idea, it would be wonderful. I, I would say that partly uh, these European networks have helped a lot in uh, establishing um, infrastructure for, for example, in my case, these, this very particular topic of, of interpreter mediated data. So it, it was an important Thing to have that um, and to, 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 to make the technical side uh, uh, strong and to say that that's important. We need a kind of infrastructure, we need help desks, we need um, people who uh, care about the, the backup of these data. Yeah? And, um, but I think it, it is still that, that many institutions underestimate the level of work that is needed to maintain such infra infrastructure and to develop tools, for example, further to, to, to enhance interoperability, et cetera. So it is really a large effort. And I think the only justification for that effort is that um, people use data and that um, it is, for example, used in class, that it is used for other research projects that it is somehow accessible for, for people who want to write a master thesis, whatever. That's the justification for all these efforts. It's not a, um, uh, an, an aim in itself, but rather uh, an aim to, to um, make technologies and yeah, even, even exotic data types uh, available to, to other people. And in our case, it was really the experience that we had to advertise this corpus um, strongly. So we had to do a lot of things so that people use it, um, that, that people get the idea, oh, I can also work with that. And um, still the, the number of users is yeah, not very, very big. It's, it's like 100 people maybe or something like that. Okay, there are some questions on the ch in the chat now. Uh, they uh, start with Erandi, uh, the, the new uh, questions. Uh, maybe you can read them. The first question is uh, for, for, profession, for, for Professor Williams mainly, uh, but I guess that's, uh, I, I would like to ask that question too, uh, even in uh, reference to maybe uh, delicate, how to treat delicate data or data which are in need of particular protection. Uh, so how ethical it is to really compile specialized corpora of, um, of online texts. Uh, are there any uniform standards? Uh, then there are some more practical questions uh, in the list, but you, you, I mean, you can probably start with, the, with this one. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't see anything unethical about it because if it's made available, it's freely available. Um, on the other hand, if you're talking about my Scientex corpora, we had the permission of all the editors. Um, I believe that you join a community. We were working on a scientific, well, we were looking at it from a particular point of view on trying to help in teaching and also in the um, developing open access in um, open science. So we were in contact with all the editors. In all cases, um, we do so. So I think it's perfectly ethical. The main problem is, of course, you're only getting part of the data from a community because a lot of the other data will be published in standard journals. So you recognize you've not got access to all the data. Then you have to standardize because um, their standardization, this is where I mentioned, I think, post-editing because their uh, 
structure is not our structure. So this is where you develop a TEI model, which allows you to break it down into appropriate sections, depending on the sort of data you've got. And there is no standard model because it, the corpus is going to vary. But if you want a, a, a sort of standard structure, well, TEI corpus, you will find on the TI guidelines, there's lots of information on how you structure your corpus. But then the next stage is um, understanding what you've got. And uh, again, this is something where grey literature would help you see what you're doing and why you're doing it. But even if you look at different types of um, part of speech tagging, um, there's many different systems. You've simply, simply got to see which one you're using. Um, when it comes to digital corpus, then using the corpus results later on for language pedagogy, um, well, you're depends on what you're trying to do. We were trying to um, show language choices within specific domains and also the interaction between domains. So it's not teaching people to use scientific language as such, but telling them to, to how you would interaction between different terminological choices because of the different domains. So I think that's the, uh, that's the answer, if, but I hope it is okay. But basically, I don't see any ethical problem there. But I always believe you should be in contact with the community and not simply taking stuff off the web because it's there. Second question about parallel bilingual corpora. I can't answer that, I'm afraid, because I don't do bilingual work, um, and especially if it's user friendly. In the name for user friendly. Um, Jeff, you have a hand up. Don't have an answer to that question, actually. <laughs> so I, I think um, maybe it's also not possible to have an annotation tool um, that fits all purposes. You know, so maybe it's um, uh, yeah something. I mean, there is technology available to create corpora um, for different purposes, of course. Uh, but the annotation procedure is something that is usually in a way more or less inbuilt into the technologies. So it's not that you need an annotation tool, but rather you, you have a kind of technology to create your corpus. And then um, there is usually also an option to, to annotate uh, the data. Yeah. But a tool that um, annotates automatically, I would even say be careful with that because it is highly, it is not a technical thing. It is not a um, technical procedure. It's a kind of, um, yeah, interpretative step that, that um, brings you in contact with your data. And so I think it's not a tool that should do that. It's a researcher that, that does it, yeah, to, to learn about your course, to, to get in touch with the data. Of course, it's good to have some um, some help <laughs> from the machine, <laughs> but it's not the machine that is doing it. Yeah. There's another question for you, Bernd, um, uh, from Julia Delfini. That's uh, the last but one in the list. And then there's a question for, okay. uh, for, for Jeffrey Williams. Uh, um, uh, if you recommend TI annotation for spoken corpora, I guess it's <laughs> a big question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How does the analysis change when a speaker uses the language as a lingua franca? And is there a need for more annotations? I would say yes. I mean, that really depends on your um, research interest and your research question. So it's it's not not a not a not a, an issue that that can be um, answered once and for all, but rather it is um, depending on what you want to know, what you want to get out of the data. But of course, it is important if someone is speaking in a language that is not his or her native language, and um, uh, or if if someone is a second language speaker with only a limited knowledge in that language, um, because certain structures, for example, can be interpreted quite um, differently as a mistake, for example, or as as a kind of um, mocking or as whatever, you know. So, for example, in German nowadays, you can use um, certain uh, verbs without prepositions. So you can say, I go cinema, not I go to the cinema. So that is, in the past, it has been used as a mocking of foreigner talk. Yeah, so foreigners speak like that. 
Today, it's becoming more and more normal that people say something like that. I go cinema, what, what are you doing? What are you go, going for? I'm going, I go cinema. Yeah. So that's something that, that's, uh, yeah, it, it's clearly not standard German, but it is possible to talk like that. And um, of course, you want to know whether a native speaker talks like that or a person that ha has recently arrived and uh, only speaks a bit of German. Yeah because that would change your, your interpretation of that uh, speech style. Okay, Jeffrey, would you like to answer if you recommend TI annotation for spoken corpora? Um, I would say yes, because we're, if we're talking about interoperability, you have uh, a well-designed system which would allow you to, um, to code, to code lots of different aspects of the corpora, um, recommend changes to the community. It's a big community, so you can always talk to the community and find out what they would say to right and what's wrong. And also, simply as I say, it's interoperable, and we are, if you can make your data available, and normally now our research should be within the FAIR network of open science, letting other people use it. Um, then TEI is a standardized system which is adaptable. It's not, um, it's guidelines. It's not giving you strict rules. So I think it is a good system. That's, that's my outlook. Okay. Any other question? Can I ask both of you how you would uh, go along with uh, uh, data, uh, with the, let's say, audio or visual part of the data, for instance, in uh, con conversational corpora? Um, I, I mean, if I, um, I mean, what I'm trying to do now is basically to make available the digitized version of uh, all the Pixie. Uh, corpora, which which was a corpora, parallel corpus of English and Italian conversation in bookshops, and uh, the uh, the digitized version of the tran transcript has been made available for a while, but the audio uh, part is never. Uh, so, um, any advice about that? Mm, uh, advice about what <laughs> exactly? <laughs> But how to make it available? I, I don't have a privacy problems because it's old enough as to be free yeah. from uh, from being from, from privacy protection uh, laws and regulations. Um, mm -hmm. It was collected in the 80s when we didn't have, uh, uh, and I guess people are no longer on this <laughs> recognizable mm -hmm. after so many years. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether there is a, a sort of best possible mm -hmm. system to to make uh, mm, the uh, transcript easily accessible together with the audio or, or the audio retrievable in some way together with the transcript. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> <laughs> that very much depends yes, the, on how much, how much work you want to put into it. I mean, if you want to, you can retranscribe it and, and use um, a kind of tool that, that uh, aligns audio and uh, uh, the, the written transcript, um, which is possible, technically possible. But I think this is a very um, general problem that, that many people have. You have legacy data, data that comes from the past and that is somehow interesting that needs to be integrated into some larger collection. And then, um, yeah, it's clear that a single person or an academic in your position cannot do that because it's a, a lot of, yeah, yeah, you need a lot of technical knowledge, you need support, you need assistance that help you with the details. So it's, it's really, yeah, it's not easy. There's no, not uh, uh, an application that simply does it for you. So you need someone who helps you with that. And I think that's why the infrastructure for uh, digital humanities is so important. I mean, that's why we, we need networks like Clarine and others. And um, I think still many universities do not 
uh, understand that um, if you want to publish that, uh, it's nothing that you can do in your spare time, you know, in your, <laughs> in your holidays or something like that. It's, it's a really sophisticated technology needed and a lot of knowledge um, from information technology, for example, to uh, address all these issues. And then you also need someone who hosts all the data and who, who um, yeah, cares about uh, the, the, the web interface and things like that. And I, I would say in Germany, at least, it's something that you, you, universities um, yeah, don't really see, that they have to put a lot of money and, and uh, personal into that to um, make that possible. Yeah. So, um, so it's a negative, <laughs> negative answer. Sorry. My first um, answer was get lots of money as well, because uh, it is a big task. Um, it depends on your country. I think in France, we, well, at least I work a lot within um, a French network, which is called Humanum. It's, been, it's um, financed by the government and it's part of the European Daria network for digital humanities data. So we have a uh, we have servers where we can put our data online because we're, we're supposed to do it. So we can store it. With TEI, you can link uh, to image or sound, but um, it's a big job. Um, so that's, yes, it's, I think one of the big problems we have in the social sciences and humanities is we don't have research engineers available um, to help us, and it is a big job. Now, if Italy's part of Daria, it's worth looking into that because you must have a similar structure. Um, within Clarin, I don't know because I don't work in the Clarin network. The other thing I would say is um, I do link uh, spoken, well, transcriptions to um, to recorded data, and I simply use a CACDAS um, computer-assisted data analysis software, uh, NVivo, or the one I use is Atlas T. So you're working, you can work in groups. There is expensive software, but um, it means you're you're working at the level of researcher or group of researchers, and that works very effectively. Um, if you want to have everything available, you've got a big task ahead. So I'd say a cactus is to stay on the ground and get the work done quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Any of our students who are struggling with the making up their corpora every day? <laughs> I saw a question there about it being fun. That's just me being slightly uh, facetious. Um, but if you don't like what you're doing, oh, that's um, right. don't do it. Basically, you're in the wrong job. Um, so building corpora yeah, it's hard work. Yes, there's frustrations because things just don't fall out well all the time. Um, but really, the fun is because you're involved in what you're doing. And I think research is about enjoying the fact that you're doing research. If you're a dedicated researcher, um, then, it, then it is fun. It's not fun in the sense of fun and games, but it means it's something you really love doing. So that's what I meant by fun, uh, and the masochism that came after. Well, yeah, because it's uh, it's it's hard work. You don't always get a solution. There's not always an easy answer. There's always going to be frustrations, but you do it because you're dedicated to your research. There is also another uh, question in the list which we skipped. That is, uh, um, to someone who has never built a corpus, <laughs> where would you suggest to start to learn the craft? Uh, I guess you already suggested that, but I I don't know if you want to add uh, anything to that. And then there's a last question here. 
um, I think that the most challenging thing about building a corpus is maintaining homogeneity. That's a comment rather than a question, but I don't, want if you, uh, I don't know if you want to comment on this idea of homogeneity. I guess that definitely uh, concerns the uh, encoding uh, system, but um, okay. So uh, learning from, uh, learning the basics and uh, homogeneity. Well, the best place to start is the beginning. Um, and uh, I would, when you get my slides, take that book in which John Sinclair has a chapter and read the chapter by John Sinclair. It's um, 2005. It's the end of decades of work of thinking through corpora, and he goes into detail of what there is there. That's the first answer. Second answer is um, I can't answer because I don't know why you're doing it. And you've got to know why you're doing it. Once you know why you're doing it, you start applying criteria to choose your data. And I think the, the answer is there. So read um, the book that you must read if you can get hold of it is Corpus Concordance Collocation by John Sinclair, uh, 1991, a brilliant book. Um, libraries should be able to have it. And that gives you the, the absolute roots of corpus linguistics and why it developed. I think that's the answer. Second end is, is knowing why you're doing it. Homogeneity um, is like representativity. Um, they're both yeah, vital and neither exist. The answer to the, the craft question is that um, <clears throat> sorry. Yes. Federico, yeah. were you trying to say anything? Ah, sorry. Um, yeah. Yes, the, 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 the thing about Something homogeneity, I, I thought that the other people were speaking and then I'm, I, I'm muted my microphone, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the thing about homogeneity is, uh, my comment is also referred to um, the fact that sometimes when we choose <laughs> to collect our, our corpus, our, uh, the, the, the text for our corpus, uh, it is um, difficult, for example, when sometimes uh, we, won't, we would like to choose one source, but it is not available. And therefore we are obliged to, to check for another source, but it is not homogeneous or coherent with our initial aim for building the corpus. This was my comment. Um. On that, I would say that if you have um, broken your corpus into sections and not seen it as a mass of text, which is always dangerous, then you simply use a tool such as TXM, um, Corpus Workbench, but TXM is the most recent one. Um, and it's, the, it's, uh, it's built from the basis of, Z of the old Zera thing. Um, it allows you to use TEI to, to partition your corpus and then compare the different bits so that you create homogeneity I don't think really exists any more than representativity because you, you've always got to sort of, you've always got to manoeuvre between what's homogeneous at one point and what's not at another. But if you do categorise your corpus, you should be able to pull out the bits and compare those bits. Thank you. Um, okay, there is a last question about uh, um, uh, the dictionary project, but uh, uh, maybe Bernd, if you want to add anything on, the, on the, these last questions and then we leave uh, five minutes to uh, Jeffrey to, to maybe tell us something about uh, the dictionnaire. Yeah, I have only one comment to the, the homogene homo homogeneity problem. <laughs> I would say if something is not available, then, uh, yeah, then maybe you have to shift your focus. That's also an option because if you go to the field and you go and collect data, that's actually the, the ethnographic uh, approach. You, you, you never know what you get, okay? So for example, in my case, the um, interpreter mediated conversations are not freely accessible. You cannot simply go into a hospital and, and tape record conversations. So you need to get access, you need to talk to many people and and after a while you you, you see um, what you can get <laughs> so it's not that you have a plan and then you simply uh, do it but rather uh, it, it's a kind of it's a process and that's also an option to, to shift your focus away from the initial initial um, research question to, to, to some other research question 
because very often you have obstacles in your way and then you have to move around somehow bypass these obstacles. Yeah. So I also think homogeneity um, on which level, you know, as a, is it um, uh, all texts from the same genre, for example, that's one level of homogeneity or from all from the, the same author or, or what, what, what kind of homogeneity do you really need for that particular question? That depends completely on your research interest, actually. Thank you. Thank you, Bernd. Um, Jeffrey, would you like to say something about uh, this digit, this big digitization? I mean, <laughs> digiting. Yes, okay. Very quickly, uh, if you've got several days ahead of you, I can explain it in, in detail. Um, basically, if you take the Frantex corpus, the Frantex corpus was built from, well, about in the 70s, really, um, purely to provide citation examples for a dictionary of French, the Trésor de la Langue Française. Um, my challenge is I'm working on a re-edition of a major French dictionary, an encyclopedic dictionary, um, the first published in 1690, and I'm working on a digital version of the 1701, which is a highly expanded version. This was built on a vast amount of texts, which uh, in great majority are available in um, PDF format. So my dream is um, using, getting access to those texts, developing the tools, we are developing tools to be able to go from the citations back to a corpus because um, the chap building the dictionary, Henri Banache de Beauval, was actually reading all these, a vast amount of books. So we should be able to trace that corpus and use it as a background into uh, science of the late, 17th century, because um, it was Europe-wide networks that he was using. So um, it's pure madness. Um, but I believe that our culture, what we have in the libraries of Europe um, is our common European heritage. And it's a great shame that Europe doesn't recognize that heritage should be made available and um, could be made available. And there you can start doing the impossible, which is um, OCRs work well, can work well on 17th century texts. We're doing it. So it's, it's, it's sheer madness, but the idea is to try and develop a corpus that will reflect what is found in that dictionary. So as to look all the different currents that are there. I'm currently working on, um, I do lots of things, but I'm currently working on maritime technology from that period and I'm also doing some work with a colleague on um, Brazilian plants. He mentioned a dictionary, why he's mentioning them, but the most important thing is how did he get the information? What was out there at the time that he could use that information to build, uh, to, to enter those things into the dictionary. So this is the sort of thing I'm trying to do. So I'm basically from somebody who spent his life building modern corpora, I've now gone back to the 17th century. I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any other question? We have five minutes. If we want to use them. <laughs> if you want mine, you simp uh, the, 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 the historical thing, you simply send me an email and I can give you a link to the, the site. It's all in French, I'm afraid. Um, but I, we do, we are publishing some stuff in English, but it's mostly in French at the moment because it's a French dictionary. Polina, maybe you can read French. <laughs> the person who asked the question. We've got articles coming out in English as well. So there are some articles in English, but most of the work is happening in French. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, people are thinking, um, can I express my thanks for this opportunity to speak? It's been great fun. It's very weird not knowing who you're speaking to. 
um, because I, 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 I try and get reactions from people and you don't get reactions from a screen. But um, thank you, it's been great fun this and it's been nice interacting with Bernd. Um, uh, great fun. Again, fun you see, but serious fun I hope. Yeah, I can only agree to that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really good to have some exchange actually because everything is so limited at the moment and it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's only it's difficult to, to meet people even uh, even in the Zoom, it's, it's mm. difficult, as yeah. we have seen. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's actually good to keep in touch in some way, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I, should, sorry, I just wanted to say I should thank you also for accepting the duet format. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it is sometimes really challenging, um, but probably first of all, because uh, we, I, <laughs> are, am not used to it, uh, but also, um, yeah, because uh, in a sense, it, it collects a lot of people, doesn't it? Uh, but then also uh, regulating, deciding, deciding turn-taking <laughs> becomes yeah. a sort of challenge. <laughs> Six months ago, I had never heard of Zoom. I use it all the time now. <laughs> My university doesn't like Zoom actually for data protection issues. So they don't, don't, they don't want us to use it. Oh, really? It's very strange oh. um, because actually, yes, there's been a big problem with that. But um, my university uses Teams, which is Microsoft. And in terms of yeah. leaking data, they're the last people I would trust. <laughs> um, but right. In fact, um, my work is uh, in France is worked is working with the uh, INRIA, which is the National Institute for Applied Computing, and these people are neurotic about security. Everything we use is totally secure, but we use Zoom. They use Zoom, so if they use Zoom, it can't be that bad. Um, but we we Skype was banned at one point. Um, they don't like Zoom. Um, you know, let's face it; we've got to have something. But there are different types of Zoom. In oh, some hello. cases, you can you can <laughs> store Zoom on your own on your own computer network, and that's the only legal alternative you have in Germany and in the European Union. We should we should stick to these European recommendations. The, the problem is that there are two types. You can have a a personal Zoom anytime, and then of course everything is in the US, but if your university buys their own Zoom version, then everything is held on their own servers. And that's that's the same with, with all these uh, uh, technologies now. Unfortunately, it costs money, but the universities should be able to pay for that, even in Mainz. <laughs> we have in Modena. <laughs> yeah, we did. We, we, have we, we managed buying it. It, it was uh, hard, but, <laughs> but in yeah. the end we succeeded. <laughs> well, that's great. So, so we feel, we feel safe. <laughs> so your recording is stored on our computers. Perfect. But, uh, will be shared with the students if you have authorized and, and with all the participants. Yeah. <laughs> So and I, and I'm yeah, you can share it with everyone. Shall we send our slides to you? It, or? That, that would be yeah. lovely. It, it would yeah. be much appreciated. I saw yeah. many messages okay. in the That's chat asking for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, it's, okay. it's fine. I mean, no secrets. <laughs> <laughs> open, open access, open science. The age of sharing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Okay. Exactly. Okay. Okay, Marina. I leave Good. it up to you to conclude. Marina was the the real the, the person who actually uh, organized all this. So uh, we, I think we I'll, are I'll, all I'll, grateful to her. I'll just say I'll just have to say the word. Uh, thank you very much for uh, everything you've given us. I think that some of the students will probably need some time to think about it. So it'd be great to have the recording and the slides and we'll certainly have more opportunities to discuss these things. Thanks a lot, because I think you've given us a lot of um, suggestions and touched on many useful points. As usual, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. And see everyone next week. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> those of you who will be back next week. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks again. Bye-bye okay. <laughs> and thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>